Well, welcome back, everyone. We certainly hope your conversations were engaging and informative, and we look forward to learning more about them. I did sample each one of you a little bit um, over the course of the last 45 minutes, and it, it sounded extremely interesting. Um, for those at home, we want to hear from you, too. We encourage you to share highlights of your conversations with us by emailing them to civiclearning at ed.gov. Joining me on stage are the five reporters representing in each discussion. To keep us on schedule, we'd appreciate it if each person could try to limit his or her response to about a minute. <laughs> I'll ask that you please introduce yourself and which discussion group you are in, and with the, le the last 30 seconds, share with us some key highlights <laughs> from your breakout. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> please. I'm Ron Crutcher, president of Wheaton College, the original Wheaton College in Massachusetts. Um, and I, I was in the, the group that really ad advancing civic learning uh, P through 20. We, we said K through 12, but we, it really should be three to th uh, P through 20. We had a really good but, you know, intense discussion because we didn't have enough, as much time. But I, I think there, there are three points that I want to make. First of all, uh, there were a lot of comments about the fact that um, oftentimes um, civic learning is, or civics looked at as being one course or one experience, and that there should be a sequential arc throughout the P through 20 uh, experience, and that th this, that these uh, experiences should be just that, experiences, doing things, as a young woman from Western Kentucky said. Being engaged, engagement is critically important. Number two, that um, higher ed leadership, uh, leadership in general is important. That is to say that the person who, the persons who are leading the institution have to set the tone and that in order to ensure that you can measure or demonstrate that your, uh, in your, your students are engaged in civic learning, that you develop some ways of developing civic portfolios, civic experience portfolios uh, as a means of, of, uh, of demonstrating the experiences that your students have had. And then thirdly, that inquiry about student learning, about civic learning, excuse me, um, can really be cross-disciplinary. That is, it can cross disciplinary boundaries. That it's not that civics should not be thought of uh, being only the purview uh, in the purview of the political science professors. And that that uh, and and that, in a sense, in order for us to truly be successful. Uh, at uh, engaging all students, because we also talked about the civic learning being per, a per, pervasive experience. We really have to infuse civic learning and engagement across the curriculum, P through 12, uh, three, P through 20. Okay. Thank you very much, Shirley. Hello, Tim Eatman, a faculty member at Syracuse University and uh, Director of Research for Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life. Uh, we were in the public scholarship uh, uh, breakout group that was moderated by Nancy Cantor and Julie Ellison and I uh, gave some <clears throat> introductory remarks, but we had three, about three takeaways as well. And one was a, a very astute observation that uh, we are now at a level of engagement with uh, engaged scholarship and publicly engaged work, uh, where we can probably create some market pressure that rewards incentives and allows universities to take this on in a full way. So the groundwork is laid and there's an openness uh, uh, and opportunities to solidify uh, these, these efforts. Uh, and that too, secondly, we need to think about leveraging the power of different voices, of knowledge makers that come out of these sorts of collaborations. And so uh, foundations and other philanthropic groups can help us create a market for alternative ways to uh, have impact in the community and to create a genuinely, uh, a genuine, sustainable, and respectful relationships. This uh, matter of creating respectful relationships is something that uh, we struggle with and we have to do a great bit 
uh, uh, more work in terms of studying and understanding. And thirdly, we probably should give some attention to focusing on early career scholar alliances and how we can leverage uh, graduate student and early career scholar networks uh, across institutions and associations to do that. So as a national alliance, we can figure out uh, federal as well as philanthropic cha uh, changing policies on who can get grants, incentivizing collaborative alliances among community alliances, and taking on issues like broader impacts that uh, register with, uh, in agencies like the NSF and, and other uh, agencies. So that's what uh, we can report in this quick time. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Blaise Scarnati from Northern Arizona University, and, and our session uh, was on build and strengthen community campus connections uh, with George Mahaffey and Ira Harkavy. And uh, out of the uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, questions we developed for the session, we really, because uh, of time, focused on two. Primarily, what are the key ideas and core values that bring campus and community members together in civic conversations to actualize public democratic work? There are several uh, ways of unpacking that question. One, we're really exploring core values that motivate uh, why we're engaging uh, as higher education, why we're engaging with the community, such as place-based uh, development, social justice, uh, the desire to develop civic agency and democratic capacities, uh, civic professionalism. And also then, uh, what are the core values um, in how one actually engages with the community? Um, that they're reciprocal dialogue, that it's a flat learning space, that everyone gets something out of it. Um, there were cautionary uh, words brought forward about uh, being careful not to colonize the communities in which we're working, uh, for example, and that, be, that we want to develop cooperative relationships, and a variety of other ideas that came out, such what are the boundaries and, and roles for education in the community, how do we interact. Uh, we need to develop, a, a move really from simple answers to more complex answers, defining the mutual benefits for communities and higher education uh, each, uh, uh, and as well as uh, understand uh, really that fundamentally as our work as academics, so much of it really is uh, based uh, uh, in and of the community. For example, the field of sociology was, was brought, for, uh, brought up as an example. In addition, how do we enable enthusiasm really to develop um, for civic agency in all classes and among all of our students? Um, the second question was, uh, really, how do we incentivize uh, all of this? And, and there was a lot of discussion about what incentivization means within this context. Um, basically, uh, coming down to breaking down the uni uni unidirectional flow of power and knowledge and to develop those reciprocal and long-term relationships. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jean Johnson. I'm here uh, with the National Issues Forums and also I'm with Public Agenda. And uh, our group was uh, Deepening Civic Identity, Values, and Vision. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, I think the cornerstone of the meeting was we saw this is a moment of crisis, but also a moment of uh, opportunity. Uh, but that we really need to make the case for the role of higher education in solving this problem. And that that means changing expectations both of higher education institutions, but also of students and faculty. And in talking about this with a lot of very good examples, I thought that we came up with a lot of very uh, natural, understandable, accessible ways to talk about this mission that could really resonate with a lot of the public. Um, that we want to see students and our institutions as problem solvers. Students should learn to see themselves as agent of change. Uh, they need to find a way not only to have an idea, but to make it happen and not wait for the politicians. We need to model democracy as a way to solve problems within our institutions and in student government. Uh, we need to start dialogues on controversial issues and show that those can take place. And the example here was in Wisconsin football, which I'm still having trouble imagining, but that was the example. Uh, we need to have relationships that create imagination. Uh, we need to teach students that they can plant a seed and watch it grow. We need to encourage in our students the hunger to understand how things work so that they can help shape them. Um, we need to uh, teach our students that listening is as important as having a voice, and it's an absolute priority that we work together to collect stories uh, to give the American people the sense that this can be done, and that there is a genuine hope and opportunity here. Good afternoon, I'm Sarita Brown with Excelencia in Education, and our discussion was focused on provide evidence, civic learning, and college success. 
Uh, we had a great running start because in addition to the uh, wonderful information that has been shared verbally by Carol and the report from AACNU, AACNU has dug even deeper and mined what evidence already is available. Ashley is here, I don't see her at the moment, but has a handout um, that has already looked at uh, existing surveys and questions of pertinence in terms of this broad and uh, on ongoingly defined uh, definition of civic learning, civic democracy. Um, the other aspect of the um, evidence is um, evidence that we used in the report itself. Um, as a person who oftentimes looks at things in a macro way in my day job, I found that the uh, 10 indicators of anemic U.S. civic health, uh, which are on page two or four of uh, the Crucible report, including things like the U.S. ranked 139th in voter participation of 172 world democracies in 2007. You can go on with this. This is another place that if we were to consider what's the evidence that we use to say that we have this need, this would be uh, a way to frame the data gathering that we would need to be able to respond. That's from an external perspective. Our discussion simultaneously looked at what would have to go on within institutions. What are some of the issues that we would deal with there? And one of the aspects that I think will be part of this work going forward is the continual definition. Um, president of uh, uh, Cal State University, Monterey Bay, kept talking about what is it? Uh, what is it that we are all talking about? Um, the in, uh, definition of engaged citizen. Um, how does the faculty see their place in that? What is their, their responsibility? Um, the fact that we already know that there are impact, there are high impact practices that are not only able to uh, help students navigate their place in the world and their responsibilities, but also succeed and graduate is something that we want to keep at the forefront of our problem solving for our future evidence. And then there was a whole set of very important practical issues that we're talking about doing this at a time that academic institutions, public institutions in particular, are facing pretty significant budget cuts. And so the opportunity for us to work collectively and collaboratively to share each other's work, to have surveys that can be shared across the field, to pool our learnings, to go forward. All of this was part of our discussion and really uh, just the beginning. So I think that in terms of this hard-edged notion of evidence, there's a lot of energy here and there's a lot of readiness to do it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of the reporters for very concise and sharp uh, feedback to us on what, what took place. And I ask them to please step down at this point. Um, and giving them another hand, please. Well, clearly this was a teaser. Uh, uh, these sessions were very short and meant to stimulate um, uh, your engagement with this and motivate you to work uh, even more energetically uh, toward the cause of civic learning. We don't want the conversation to stop here, and we hope that the, the event is, will serve as a catalyst uh, for future activities and exploring ways we can further our commitment to the advancement of civic learning and democratic engagement. So as part of this conversation, we'd like to share with you some of the commitments that we have made uh, and are making to advance this important mission. And to start us off, I'd like to welcome back to the stage Carol Schneider, President of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, and Harry Boyd, Director of the American Commonwealth Partnership. You should already have received in the uh, uh, breakout groups the copy of the commitments that uh, over 75 organizations and colleges, universities, and community colleges have made. So I hope everybody has this. Uh, Harry and I are both going to be referring to it as we uh, try to share with you the good work that has already been planned to go forward from this launch. So this is just an illustration. These are just suggestive. It's, as Carol said, these, there's a very rich body of initiatives um, they were catalyzed in the last several months, um, but they're suggestive of the range and the richness of possibilities and practical initiatives. I'm going to talk about two, and then Carol's going to talk about two points of the star, and then I'm going to talk about the final point of the star. So under deepening civic identity, which is really 
we think, the democracy colleges for the 21st century. Um, just to highlight a, a several things. Um, we are uh, planning with the National Issues Forums um, and the Kettering Foundation and other deliberative groups a series of conversations across the country about what kind of citizenship do we need and how to educate for it and what's the role of education and higher education in that process. Um, Kettering will produce materials um, that will be online for our, at the National Issues Forum will make it online. Um, I would say at the deepest point, this was the theme that came out in our group, it's really about agency. How can people stop complaining about what's happening out there and say, what can we do? We are the ones we've been waiting for, in the words of the old civil rights song. Um, secondly, there's uh, Democracy U, which many of you have seen. We begin to pass around a commitment statement, but uh, it's a website that will continue to expand stories. It's connected to a Facebook page and Twitter. Um, we want to really use this as a resource. So during the Blair House, I'm going to put a sign-up sheet. Who would make a commitment to work with the democracy, you, in different ways? Publicize it, um, get out the word, write stories. We've already had some commitments just in a couple of minutes passing it around. And thirdly, under the civic uh, identity, um, we, uh, we want to highlight a very creative initiative which Julie Ellison and her colleagues have um, begun called Citizen Alum. In a time of budget crisis and shortening and scarcity consciousness, Citizen Alum offers tremendous opportunities to shift their paradigm to abundance by looking at and creating partnerships between colleges and universities and their alumni and all the different kinds of work and learning and civic agency and creative efforts they're doing can be tremendous pedagogical resources if we broaden the paradigm of what is involved in alumni relations. So under civic identity, just a few of the things. Under um, strengthening connections between campuses and communities, um, you saw on the, on the STAR video Muriel Howard talking about the long-standing commitment of the state colleges and universities to being stewards of place. This next year, a couple of things to highlight in that regard. Um, there will be a civic health assessment, which we brief briefly referenced. That is, there will be a working group that the American Democracy Project is putting together, uh, which will look at the impact of colleges and universities on the communities in which they're located. Now, again, this really holds challenge possibilities to the reigning ranking systems, which tend to discourage involvement in communities, actually. Um, and secondly, um, there, there's a, a partnership forming between uh, groups like the Anchoring Institution Task Force and the American uh, colleges and universities around uh, how to strengthen ties, how to develop policies, how to work with federal agencies around uh, uh, how to strengthen communi community campus connections. Thank you. So moving on to uh, two more prongs of the STAR, uh, the commitment to advance civic learning and democratic engagement and make it, in the words of Crucible uh, Moment, pervasive rather than peripheral, uh, and also providing evidence about the difference this actually makes to students. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, energy that's gone into all these issues, and in fact, some 13 of the organizations that are mentioned um, on the commitments list have agreed to work uh, across their various um, sites of, of activity with AAC and U in partnership to lift up models for that developmental arc for um, civic learning that we're talking about. And uh, just to give you one illustration of something that uh, is going to happen in that connection, the Democracy Commitments, with Brian, which Brian Murphy talked about earlier, a new network of community colleges working directly on this issue, uh, will be, has been funded by uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, and we thank you, uh, to work with AAC and U and all of our members, which include community colleges, but other kinds of institutions as well, to develop models for civic learning that are particularly applicable to those uh, students in the first two years of college. Uh, I also want to uh, call attention to work that Bringing Theory to Practice uh, is doing. That is a national network that across all the various philanthropies has probably put more resources into more institutions to lift up civic learning as a shared priority. 
uh, than virtually any other. Sally Pingree is here with us today, and I want to thank her for her long-term commitment to this um, and other foundations as well that have supported it. They will soon be announcing an RFP uh, to support additional institutions in work to make civic learning more pervasive, uh, to bring it further into the core mission and core work of all our institutions. Uh, so watch for that. I think the time is February, and you'll, you can find out about it on our website. Uh, and then finally, in the area of learning, uh, I hope everyone in this room is aware that the Lumina Foundation is putting a huge amount of energy behind an effort to define what the it is for what is it what students have done when they're ready to receive an AA degree or a BA degree or an MA degree? They are inviting institutions and associations and accreditors to test a draft description of what a college degree is supposed to mean in our time, and civic learning is one of the five essential components that they are testing. This is an opportunity for all of us to say, yes, this is what a high-quality degree includes, uh, and to be part of that conversation, and if we haven't got it quite right, make it better. Make it better. Don't say, we don't want one size fits all. We'll never have one size fits all. We'll have many different ways of coming at this. But what we have to have is a shared understanding that this is core to our mission. Uh, in terms of uh, the assessment, uh, I'm just going to mention a couple of things that you need to be aware of. Campus Compact has been a leader in service learning, as everyone knows, uh, and has been a source of some of the important evidence showing that the more students are involved in service, the more likely they are to complete college. Now, there is no higher priority for our society than to have more people actually succeeding in college. Uh, so to show that these kinds of things actually pay off for uh, persistence and completion uh, is a very important contribution. And they are going to be taking that work further and putting more of it in the hands of, of presidents and other people who are in a position to make decisions about these issues. Our society is already committed to college completion. Let's show that civic learning actually con contributes to that outcome. Uh, and then finally, in the context of Lumina's work, um, both ASCU, which of course has been a leader on stewardship of place and campus community partnerships and democracy in the curriculum and co-curriculum, and AACNU, which is deeply committed to this, each have grants to work with state systems, 12 states altogether, grants from Lumina, community colleges, four-year institutions, to work on ways of assessing students' learning outcomes as they move from one level to another. And therefore, we have agreed as two associations to create a working group that will go deeper into what it means to actually assess students' gains in civic competence uh, and capability as a consequence of their college experience. So um, some things that are going to happen. It's only the tip of the iceberg, but we are organized to go forward. And finally, under public scholarship, um, a really deeply transformative concept. Again, scholarship in public, with publics, and for public purposes. Um, there are several things I want to highlight. Uh, first of all, as I understand it, the public scholarship group discussed creating an ongoing policy working group that we want to connect with ACP work to look at how to develop policies to strengthen public scholarship. Now, there are a lot of opportunities here. For example, the, as Julie Ellison has pointed out, the, the scoring systems in NEA or NEH grants have a lot of difference, make a lot of difference in terms of how public scholarship is. Um, universities and colleges also have policy dimensions that are tremendously powerful in terms of promotion and tenure guidelines. But the policy dimension is important. Um, Secondly, um, I want to hear also highlight the civic science discussion uh, we're uh, sponsoring in the American Commonwealth Partnership, which grows out of a number of years. Um, but it's really, again, about how to understand the constitution of science and the questions that scientists ask, as well as how they work with different constituencies and groups. Um, there's a partnership of four different institutions and, we, and centers, and we will continue this, but they include the Delta Center, uh, the Jan Group at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Northern Arizona, and especially the Teaching Climate Science and Solutions and the Center for Democracy and Citizenship to date. And finally, uh, I want to simply recognize uh, Syracuse University and the leadership of Nancy Cantor for the concept of scholarship in action, which has pioneered a notion and practice of engaged deeply democratic scholarship, which is making a real difference in the life of a community in tangible ways and also transforming the institution itself in the process. 
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and now uh, we, we're, I'm going to have an opportunity to thank everybody who's contributed to making this an outstanding event later on when we close uh, before going to the Blair House. But now uh, to start that process of closing our event, we'll hear from three key administration officials leading efforts to prepare Americans for informed, engaged citizenship. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, now uh, Jonathan Greenblatt. Jonathan Greenblatt, after arriving in September of 2011, um, uh, be became the new director of the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation at the Domestic Policy Council. Prior to joining the White House, Jonathan served as the director of the Impact Economy Initiative at the Aspen Institute, exploring ways public policy can help enable an environment which accelerates impact investing and, a scale, and scales social enterprise. He's also the founder and former president of All for Good, a nonprofit organization inspired by President Obama's call for more Americans to serve and to help strengthen communities and individuals through service. We're thrilled Jonathan could be with us here today to share his thoughts about this important initiative. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Greenblatt. Thanks so much, Eduardo. Good afternoon. How nice to see all of you here. How's the day been so far? Really? It's had a low energy. I'm a little surprised, but it sounds like you've had a good, thorough day and that Martha has worked you all well, so I'm really glad to see that. So first of all, I'm really delighted to welcome you all here to the White House. I, we think about this as the people's house, and it is really a great pleasure and privilege to see all of you here, and I know many of you came from all parts of the country to be here today and gave us your sort of best thoughts and thinking about this issue of civic learning and this issue of civic participation, which is really an essential element of our agenda. So I appreciate the kind introduction. And it's really, um, you know, it's just a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I should tell you that um, I also, before I get into it, actually, let me just take a moment, and I know there'll be thanks afterwards that Eduardo will do, but it's a privilege for me to just acknowledge Under Secretary Cantor, who's doing such yeoman's work for Secretary Duncan and helping to lead the whole administration to think differently about this issue of civic education and about education in general. Thank you, Martha, for all your support. And I also think the next round of applause should go to all of you. I mean, that was a fairly impressive list of accomplishments that were just rattled through by uh, the panelists, and the report outs are really quite remarkable. To think about the breadth of things that you've all covered in just one day, and to think about the span of activities encompassed in that report, which I've had the chance to review, and it's just quite impressive, says a lot about the level, again, of creativity and energy and thoughtfulness that you all brought to this process. So thank you for doing that. So, so for me, this issue of civic participation isn't just an idea. It's been a guiding sort of principle in my life. I first got engaged in public service as a student at Tufts University, where I was working, um, I was studying with the generous support of a work-study program. And I was motivated, actually, to join the Clinton for President campaign back in 1991 because of his commitment to City Year. And this notion that maybe, just maybe, for me, rather than working as a janitor in the dining halls, you know, and serving food and washing dishes, I could serve my community, and that might be a way that I could give back and help afford a college education. That motivated me to serve, motivated me to join that first campaign, move to Little Rock, and change my life. And so I deeply think about this notion of being involved in strengthening our communities through service and through the public process as just a vital part of my own personal journey. Here in the US, democracy really serves as a model for the world, and we think that the government has a role to play not just to govern, but actually to enable and empower all of you, our citizens, to learn and participate in our democracy and to work together to solve the problems that many of our communities face in an increasingly interconnected world. There are some great speakers who are coming after myself. And I want to highlight just a couple of them, particularly my colleague Robert Velasco, who is the uh, CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service, the federal agency that administers the AmeriCorps program and the Senior Corps program. How many of you are familiar with AmeriCorps? Raise your hands. Pretty much all of you. It's great. I mean, few people realize that programs that we care deeply about, from, from Teach for America to City Year to Habitat, a lot of Meals on Wheels programs, Public Allies, the list goes on and on of marvelous programs that are enabled through the important work of AmeriCorps. 
Robert is doing yeoman's work to lead that effort and engage Americans old and young in national service to strengthen their communities and develop the skills to be long-term leaders. Secretary Duncan will also be here this afternoon to close by talking about the role of the department working with our nation's schools, colleges, and universities to educate students for informed citizenship, um, which is important. And we've heard from also Jim Leach here today, who is doing his part, just about every federal agency counts involving empowering citizens in some way. As the remarkable list of commitments that was already announced makes clear, the federal government doesn't stand alone in our determination to strengthen democracy by preparing Americans for this notion of active citizenship or informed citizenship. But we have an important role to play nonetheless. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk to you in my brief remarks here, which really come at the end of what I know has already been a very long day. And I realize I stand between you and Blair House, so I had better be brief. Um, but I want to talk to you about this notion of social innovation. And in fact, I'd like to just throw out there, how many of you know what that means, social innovation? Okay. So I should tell you that in my other life, before coming here, I taught at uh, the Anderson School at UCLA, and I was renowned for cold calling my students. So at least some of you raised your hands. So, so what's your name, and what do you think social innovation means? Great. Okay, so investments in transformative, sustainable change. Who else? I saw their hands. I will call on you. Anybody from this side of the room? Any brave soul? The gentleman from Syracuse. I think that's excellent. I think it's an excellent response. Um, I know I'm in an audience of college and academics when ameliorate a, entrenched dysfunction is the way it's described. <laughs> but, but I think that's pretty good. I, I think the president likes to talk about it as finding new ways to solve old problems. And I think that represents pretty well what you said. <laughs> And I don't, it's okay. You're a brave soul, because I called on you. But I also think what Jonathan said is true, too, is how do we do it in a way that is truly transformative and that is sustained and that makes it not sort of a temporal difference, but one that's indeed enduring and changes systems. So that's how we think about social innovation. It's about trying new approaches that leverage market forces, that cultivate evidence-based models, and that drive cross-sector collaboration to seek new outcomes, to seek long-term impacts, to seek systems change. In this context, we aim to serve the president by focusing on a clear mission. Did you all know there was an Office of Social Innovation and Civil Participation before you saw that slide? No? Yes? Some nods? Some shrugs? Well, let me tell you what we do. We focus on one clear mission, which is elevating community solutions. It's about identifying what works and scaling it where it needs support, maybe spotlighting it where that's appropriate, maybe seeding a promising program or a high potential initiative. We're not here to invent. We're not here to create. We're not here to prescribe. The president likes to say that the solution's are already out there. They're typically on the ground, in communities, on campuses, where people come together to solve problems, where people aren't constrained necessarily by the conventions that dominate in a place like Washington, but are just about making a difference. It's our job to lift that up and amplify wherever we can. We try to do that by coming up with models that harness all of our human capital, strategies like national service or civic participation. We also focus on how do we increase the flows of financial capital? How do, can we bring more resources to bear to tackle our toughest problems? And how do we ensure the efficient utilization of those resources so we're preserving the public interest and not wasting the taxpayers' dollars? So in the context of our work on human capital, let me briefly mention the crucial role of civic participation. We believe, I deeply believe, in this idea of a civic continuum. From those of you in this room, for example, represent, I think, one aspect or one spot on that continuum. Those of you who've dedicated your lives and your careers to the public service. To those folks who participate in programs like AmeriCorps. Are there any former AmeriCorps members in the room? Raise your hands. 
Where did you serve? Boston. Boston. And what, with what organization? City Year. City Year in the back? Los Angeles. With Teach what? For America. Teach. Mm -hmm. You next to her? One over. With, with who? Um, AmeriCorps, uh, National Civilian Community Corps. Then C. Who else over here? I saw hands. You? Um, Excellent. Over here? Uh, uh, great, pro great organization. You behind her? Wonderful. How about over here? Yes. Um, Portland, Oregon. I was a leader in Wonderful. I mean, you guys represent some of our best and brightest. People who take the time to spend an oftentimes immersive experiences working on the ground in our communities. We, I also applaud episodic volunteering. Those of you who take time out of your own busy lives to spend a, a, an hour, a week, a month, a year, maybe this Monday on MLK Day, working in your communities. Um, and I also were fascinated by the new techniques of engagement enabled by technology. On a civic continuum, there are opportunities for everyone to engage and contribute to the ongoing project of our democracy. Our role in the government here is not to make the choices for people. I would suggest that elevating community solutions, the role that the President has asked me to undertake, is about ensuring that our citizens have the widest set of options available to them, so they can make informed, smart choices that align with their own values. And we can encourage entrepreneurs, and we can encourage innovators to develop the products and the services, the programs, the platforms that make civic participation easier. So the message is simple, and President Obama deeply believes it. If we make it easier for people to participate in democracy and solve our common problems, they will. And I would actually say to you, that was that spirit that elected the President just three years ago. And it's that spirit that I think will guide us for the next five years. <laughs> By the way, this is consistent with what we know from research in behavioral economics, and it's confirmed by some recent examples of social innovation. I mean, there's been a surge in this body of work that's made civic participation more possible and more productive for U.S. citizens. And whether you call them social entrepreneurs or social innovators or impact investors, there's all kinds of words floating around. But more and more, we see mavericks. We see almost like revolutionaries from the private sector and from civil society who are seizing opportunities to create transformative change that scales, to find new strategies to ameliorate entrenched dysfunction. <laughs> He'll never live that down. <laughs> but really, to simultaneously create change and transform communities. And it's our role, I would actually say to you that I'm here and it's a privilege to be here every day. It's my responsibility to do what we can to create the conditions in which that kind of enterprise can flourish. Daniel Goleman has written about radical transparency, the idea that only by exposing the true price of goods and services can we produce, that we produce and consume will we be able to make really deeply, profoundly informed choices guided by our commitments for a clean planet and for healthy relationships. He argues, and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with his work, that we provide people with more accessible information to make the choices in the marketplace that reflect their values, they will make the right choices. We see this in all the time, as I said. This is part of the spirit that animates the President every day. By creating pathways for people to participate in democracy, they will. We see this in the grocery store and the shelves, where innovators have taken commodities and found ways to imbue them with meaning and purpose, creating brands that are not just about consumption, they're actually about creating a better world. I was involved with one of these, a business called Ethos Water, that I co-founded with the idea of using a bottled water who every time you consume it, it would donate dollars to fund humanitarian water projects around the world. Today, because of the results of scores of millions of consumers, scores of millions of dollars have been devoted to water-related projects in Asia, Africa, Latin America. We see it in, we see policy driving some of this too. The higher uh, fuel standards advocated by President Obama have really helped to catalyze the evolution of clean cars from the Toyota to the Prius to the Tesla, the Toyota Prius to the Tesla, the Fisker, and lots of other hybrid models. Policy choices have created the conditions in which consumers respond. And it's not only good for the environment, it's good in terms of economic recovery and job creation. As we've seen Detroit really thrive in the past 12 to 24 months, in part shaped by policy, but make no mistake, creating real meaningful opportunities for the people of Detroit and the manufacturing base of our country. At the same time, we have to provide people with tools to make it easier 
not just to buy and to consume, but to actually take part in public life. And sometimes social innovators are the creators of new technology, but sometimes they're simply the ones who find an existing technology, a platform that's already out there, and find innovative ways to use it. So for example, and you, these are sort of torn from the headlines, so think about Twitter. Imagine this for a moment, when Biz Stone and his co-founder created Twitter, they, had, they were thinking about a better way to text messages to each other. Today, there are more than 200 million messages exchanged on that service a day. And it's evolved from a way to get in touch with your friends. Now it's become a democratizing platform that gives voice to the masses and has allowed ordinary citizens in the Middle East, in Central Europe, and around the world to be heard, despite the policies of their governments, who might otherwise feel different. Think about Donors Choose. I'm, I'm going to guess there isn't a single person in this room who's not familiar with Donors Choose. It's, I think, one of the most fascinating examples of this new modalities of civic engagement. It was an ordinary school teacher in the Bronx who needed, to, who needed dollars because of the, uh, he was a high school uh, school teacher, I should say. He needed supplies for his students. He went online to post his needs and see if anyone would donate money so his kids could have books and supplies. It was a simple idea in 2000 when Charles Best created Donors Choose. Today, over $100 million have moved through that platform, $100 million in small contributions, helping nearly 6 million kids and funding, are you ready for this, a quarter of a million projects. And it all came again from very humble origins. A teacher who simply said, we need a better way to fix an old problem. We need a better way to create change at scale. I'm also fascinated by those folks who simply take ordinary tools and put them to work. You know, Under Secretary Cantor met uh, Mark Hannis just the other day. Mark Hannis is the founder of Genocide Intervention Network. How many of you know if you have Genocide Intervention Network on your campuses, raise your hands? A couple of you. For those of you who don't know, my guess is it's already there. It's the largest network of college students it's operating on universities as well as the campuses of, co of community colleges, bringing together young people to fight against genocide. And how did it grow? How did it, how did it uh, prosper? By using the old technique of phone trees to make it easier for young people to call their congressmen and make an impact. It's a pretty remarkable platform. We see other companies as well, like Timberland, Raytheon, Whole Foods. Lots of businesses are making civic engagement, are making volunteering, part of their ethos, part of what animates all of their workers. So looking ahead, I think you'll see the White House, this office, continue to elevate community solutions to create the conditions in which companies and colleges, in which ordinary people and professional investors, in which philanthropists and citizens can come together to elevate community solutions and use social innovation as propellant to advance our domestic priorities. We'll accelerate impact. We'll create the outcomes we all hope to see. As we look ahead, I know the President and all of his staff, including myself, are excited to collaborate with all of you, with all of you, as we take this report to the next level, as we turn these recommendations into realities and demonstrate the administration's commitment to preparing citizens to strengthen our communities, our democracy, and our nation. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, our next speaker is Robert Velasco, acting CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service. In that role, he oversees the federal agency that engages in more than five million Americans, engages more than five million Americans in service through its senior core, AmeriCorps, and other programs, and leads President Obama's National Call to Service Initiative, United We Serve. Prior to being tapped for this role, Robert served as Chief Operating Officer and Acting Chief of Program Operations for CNCS. During nearly two decades of dedicated federal service, he has also worked in management program and regional operations across the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Robert is a public servant at heart and a true champion of the value and impact of service. Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for that introduction, Eduardo. It's been said that the world is run by those who show up. 
Today's conference is about preparing the next generation to do just that. This is a critical conversation about the future of civic learning and democratic engagement. And I want to thank Secretary Duncan and Undersecretary Martha Cantor for the invitation to join you today. I'm speaking immediately before one of the most passionate education champions in the nation, so I'll be brief. But I'd like to talk for just a moment about why the work of preparing students for lifelong citizenship is so important. I want to talk about why what you do as educators to engage students in the world around them matters. There is something special happening with our young people. Last year, according to our Volunteering in America report, 3.2 million college students dedicated more than 307 million hours of service in their communities. Service valued at more than $6.4 billion. More than $6.4 billion to our economy. The number of millennial volunteers has increased by almost a million per year since 2006. And recently, applications to AmeriCorps, our program that engages more than 80,000 Americans in intensive service each year, have nearly tripled. The message is loud and clear. Our nation's youth want to be more than spectators in society. At the Corporation for National and Community Service, we see the impact of young people every day on some of our country's most pressing problems. More than half a million students serve through our programs every year. They're teaching, tutoring and mentoring children, and helping individuals and communities rebuild after disasters. They're expanding access to health care and economic opportunity for our most vulnerable citizens and preserving the environment for future generations. And after their service, they're continuing their commitment to make this nation a better place. 60% of AmeriCorps alumni go into public service careers. Today, we have a few AmeriCorps members here. Can you please raise your hands? Great. Thank you for your service. <coughs> if you're ever looking for some hope for the future or to see why civic learning and engagement is so important, just spend a few minutes talking to one of them. Service works. It helps shape the lives of young people and positions them to be lifelong active citizens. Just last week, there was a report about the growing number of students graduating with law degrees who are going into public interest jobs. The experts were asked, what's behind the trend? Is it the economy, the desire for younger generations to have more work-life balance, or something else? What David Stern, executive director of Equal Justice Works and an AmeriCorps grantee thinks, is there's a generation of young people entering law school with an established commitment to public service. This means that by the time these students take their LSATs, by the time they apply to their short list of schools, by the time they take their first year courses, they've already decided that their education can be used for the common good. And that just isn't happening with law students. Young people are choosing earlier and more often to take up public service careers. That's no coincidence. That's the result of the work of many of you. Teachers and schools and organizations that take students out of the classroom and into the community, that teach our young people that they can do more than just study and analyze problems, they can help solve them. Our schools, our colleges, and our universities play a powerful role in engaging students in the world around them. That's why every year, the Corporation for National and Community Service invests more than $550 million, or more than half of our funding, in education. It's why we train, support, and mobilize thousands of professional educators who work in K through 12 in college classrooms across the country. And it's why, for two decades, We've worked to bridge service to education through all of our programs. We'll continue to do our part to cultivate the next generation of active citizens and public servants, including the tens of thousands of AmeriCorps members. 
will continue to support some of the most innovative and proven strategies to put more young people on the path to a brighter future through programs such as our Social Innovation Fund. And through the President's Higher Education Community Service Honor Roll, the Interfaith Challenge, and other initiatives, we'll continue to challenge educators to make service a central part of the student experience. Thank you for being a part of today's conversation and for what you do to connect classroom to community and community to classroom, for making civics come alive. The Corporation for National and Community Service believes in your work, we support your work, and we look forward to being a partner and a resource to you as you continue this very important work. You're helping to shape our nation by shaping our young people to be better citizens. And so as many others have said today, our success, the future of our democracy, depends on it. Thank you. Well, our, our program is supposed to end right now, but something tells me you're going to stick around <laughs> for our next speaker. Uh, it's really um, an honor for me and a pleasure to introduce um, the man who uh, certainly brought me to Washington along with Martha Cantor, and who I think uh, arguably, and I, I know I shouldn't be making comparisons, but arguably you could say that he's the most effective uh, sector of education we've ever had in this country. Uh, there's been some tremendous uh, changes uh, in the past few years uh, uh, that have really uh, energized our community uh, toward uh, meeting the president's uh, visionary and transformative goal for 2020, education goal for 2020. Uh, the secretary was confirmed by the U.S. Senate on January 20, 2009. And prior to his appointment as secretary of education, he served for almost 10 years as the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, becoming the longest serving big city superintendent in the country. Um, Secretary Duncan, uh, I think we're looking forward to hearing uh, your take on the subject we've been talking about today. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I know it's the end of a long afternoon, and I have a beautiful, eloquent speech, which I probably won't give, because I think you guys have had a long day. So I have it online tomorrow, and I'll wing it here, and I apologize if I make any mistakes. but. Uh, Keep it relatively brief. We got a nice reception after this. I first want to thank Martha and Edward and our team for all of their hard work. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> it has been an amazing couple years, and none of this stuff would be happening without their hard work, their passion, not just in the Department of Education, but across government. Robert and his team have been amazing partners, and we're all in this together. Um, I know this is the choir here, so I'll try not to do too much preaching. But I, I think, uh, simply put, uh, this anecdote unfortunately is true. I won't get my numbers right, but uh, a vast major, a, a much higher percentage of Americans can name the three stooges than can name the three branches of government. And so that's our collective responsibility, is to, is to change that basic fact. And uh, this work is real personal for me. My first job when I went to work for the Chicago Public Schools was to institute a service learning requirement and we required students to do 40 hours of community service. And there was lots of controversy and pushback around that. But I have to tell you, as we got rolling, I can't tell you how many young people came to me who said, I hated this, I didn't want to do it, and they ended up doing 500, 700, 1,000 hours of service because they had the opportunity. They had never had that exposure. And for me, it's sort of going back to where Robert started. To me, we have this tremendous imbalance. Our young people have an appetite, they're committed, they want to be engaged, and somehow systemically at the elementary level, the middle school level, the high school level, and the university level, we've walked away from providing those opportunities. Somehow it's been a distraction, somehow it hasn't been seen as part of sort of the, the core set of knowledge they should understand. But for me, education's always been so much more than about book knowledge. It's really about how do we engage in a vibrant democracy. And you can teach some of those things using textbooks, but hands-on learning experiences that engage young people in the community and have them at very early ages start to see the impact they can have, I think is probably the best way to teach that. And so we're going to do everything we can to try and create more of those opportunities to make those more the norm than the exception. 
And part of the issue I struggle with so much, and this is just another example of it, is so often opportunities happen for the wealthy and for the privileged and not for the poor and not for minority students. So in my hometown of Chicago, historically, service learning and service was seen to be the activity of the private school students. And my public school students were seen as the recipients of the service. And we want to try and flip that on its head so that every single young person, whether they came from privilege or not, had an opportunity at 10 and 12 and 14 and 15 years old to demonstrate the difference they can make uh, in their communities. Right now, unfortunately, when you survey freshmen in college and then seniors in, in college, they feel they've had less opportunities to make a difference, less opportunities to be engaged over their time in college than when they entered. So that passion is there, that desire is there, but somehow we're not meeting that need. And so collectively, we have to do something very, very different. And what's so interesting to me is the exact same skills that young people learn through civic, particip through civic participation, through being part of a vibrant democracy, those are skills that need to be successful in the economy today. They need to be able to work as part of a diverse team. They need to be able to ask hard questions. They need to be able to think critically. And I think rather than being a distraction or something that pulls them off course, these are exactly the kinds of opportunities are they going to prepare them to do well, whatever they do, whether they go into AmeriCorps or whether they go work in corporate America, they are going to need these skills and these opportunities that we collectively, government, private sector, nonprofits, great uh, you know, entrepreneurial social service agencies, we have to provide many more of those opportunities going forward. I saw Brian Brady here. Brian, do we have, do we have some, our, some of our students here? Uh, no, but we've got the Chicago Ag students. We've got Chicago Ag students? Can we ask all our Chicago Ag students to please stand and give them a round of applause and Brian? <laughs> this is off topic, but Chicago Ag is one of my most favorite high schools. Uh, in the heart of Chicago, on the south side, we actually have a working farm, and that, there we had a cow give birth to a calf. So we felt we were really proud about that. But that's not why we're here. <laughs> we're here because I, I just didn't think this was important. I was able to witness what a huge difference these kinds of opportunities made. So Brian, the Nick of Challenge, did an amazing job of working with young people around Chicago to do a couple things. They set up a student advisory council that met with me on a monthly basis and that pushed me and my management team in some very significant policy ways. And we thought we were passionate. We thought we were hearing all the issues. But let me tell you, when you have 15, 16, 17 teenagers telling you, Arnie, you don't get it. You're missing what's really happening you know, in our schools and on the streets. That's profound. And that information was so helpful to us as we thought about policy. Brian also trains hundreds and hundreds of young people to go be election judges all across the city. Chicago, that's tough work. <laughs> but young people, 16, 17, before they can even vote, are participating in democracy. They're out working on a whole host of different campaigns, bipartisan, nonpartisan, but getting that exposure. These are young people who, most people might say, might be more likely to drop out, coming from tough communities, single parent homes, you know, all the disadvantages. But they are so actively engaged in what they're doing, I was absolutely confident about what they were going to accomplish long term. And so we have to continue to find ways to make these kinds of opportunities the norm. Please challenge us. We want to be a good partner. We've laid out this uh, roadmap and call to action. It has nine steps that I won't read to you. Uh, you can go through it yourself that we're committed to doing, many of which we're already trying to do. We want to take to the next level. But please challenge us. If you see us missing a beat, if you see something we're not doing, we want to hear about that. Eduardo, Martha, our entire team, we want to be good partners. The final thing I'll say is as passionate, as committed as our team is, we know we can't begin to do this all alone. And we need you. That's why we're all here. We need to work on this together. Right now, as a country, what would we give ourselves? C minus? D plus? B minus? I'm not quite sure. We're not a grade we could be proud of what we're doing. This is not a time for incremental change. This is not a time for tinkering around the edges. We've got to think radically different. We have to do it together. Hopefully today is the start of a conversation, by no means an ending point, but it's the start of a conversation. So these kinds of opportunities for 10-year-olds and 22-year-olds can become much more the norm rather than the exception. Our children need it. Their families need it. Their communities need it. Our country needs it. There's a thirst out there. There's a hunger out there. We have to do a better job of feeding that together. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your creativity. Let's get to work together. Thanks for having me this afternoon. Well, now I really am the only one standing between you and reception. <laughs>
So I just want to take a couple of seconds to thank a number of people that have helped make this possible. Thank you especially to Harry Boyd and Carol Schneider for their leadership in this process. <laughs> thank you to Karen Musil, Jim Leach, Dave Matthews, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, uh, Robert Valesco, and finally, um, and thank you to Martha Cantor. <laughs> And once again, I thank you to Secretary Duncan for, for his leadership in our department. And now I'm going to direct you to the reception, um, which is going to be at Blair House. And so you have to go north on 17th Street and turn right on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, and we're adjourned. Thank you.